Welcome to another edition of I Am Able Foundation's Medicine Makers, where if your uh, destination is a career in medicine, we'll show you how to get there. I'm your host today, Ishmael Mendoza, and I'm excited to welcome back my mentor, Dr. Nushik Salvador, who will be talking to us about palliative care today. If this is your first time watching, you can find us on CanTV21 or 99. You can also stream us online at cantv.org backslash hotline. If you have any questions today, uh, feel free to dial 312-738-1400 because we have an expert here who may be able to answer them today. If this is your first time hearing about the I Am Able Foundation, uh, the I Am Able Foundation is a Chicago area nonprofit that is devoted to raising our next generation of healthcare heroes. We are recruiting our next uh, class of mentees in a couple months. So if you are a high school, college, or postgrad student, feel free to visit www.iamable.org. And that's able spelled A-B-E-L. Mm -hmm. uh, so starting off today's session, I would like to first define what is palliative care. And for viewers who um, are aware of palliative care at home, how does it differ from hospice care? Yeah, good question. So. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to say, because there's been a lot of confusion from what palliative care is, and um, even amongst our colleagues, amongst patients. So I'd like to say first and foremost that palliative care and hospice care are two separate entities, and yet palliative care can smoothly um, extend into, finally, hospice care, which is more of an end-of-life uh, uh, care. So. Palliative care, pa the word palliate means, palliate means to end suffering or to palliate or to alleviate mm -hmm. suffering. Um, so palliative care services involves three big type of services of which we utilize to help our patients. The first one would be uh, we would go through what's called goals of care discussions with our patients. So when we have a palliative care consult placed, I myself as a consultant or an advanced, uh, advanced practice nurse would go into a patient's room and introduce ourselves uh, as part of supportive services or palliative care services to have what's called a goals of care discussion. Mm -hmm. That goals of care discussion is there so that we can talk about, about the diagnosis or diagnoses, multiple diagnoses that are ailing the body, uh, what stage it's in, and talk about what your understanding is and what family members or friends or people who are part of um, decision making or supporting that individual going through what they're going through, how, how, what do they know about that diagnosis, how it's affecting the body, how it's affecting the family. Um, because of symptoms, because of a later stage, or maybe an earlier stage. But it's time for that type of discussion so that you have a better understanding of what the diagnosis is and how it's impacting your life. So we talk again about quality of life and sometimes for certain individuals that might mean continue what they say is do everything, do everything. Right. Um, and, and so for some individuals, they, it, they may be at the stage where they say, I'm really done with certain procedures. I don't want to go through surgeries. I don't want certain procedures done. Um, and so that's the time to talk about those things so that there's a better understanding of, again, what the diagnosis is, how it's impacting your body, how it's impacting family or your, your social structure, your support. Um, and, and then how do we move forward from that? That's a goals of care discussion. Now, those are typically uh, very in-depth and time sensitive. So they can run, I've had, my longest consultation was up to four hours on, yeah. on one particular patient. And that's, that could be unusual. Um, we don't have 10 to 15 minute conversations unless the, the patient and or family members feel I just don't want to talk about this anymore because right. this is not a discussion that we force upon individuals. Um, there, sh there should be a willingness of parties to discuss what's happening. So that's part of the goals of care uh, discussion. And then uh, palliative care also utilizes what's called um, advanced care planning discussions. And so these goals of care discussions do naturally transition into what can be advanced care planning discussions. And so uh, advanced care planning is about planning uh, in the future, in advance. When you are unable to speak for yourself, 
you can appoint certain individuals that you trust right. who would follow you and be your voice so that basically they're not speaking for what they want or for themselves, but they're speaking on behalf of what you want. They are your mouthpiece. If you go into a coma, uh, if there's a diagnosis that's devastating where you just can't speak for yourself, you're intubated and on a mechanical ventilator. Mm. Um, so we, we, we try to have these kinds of advanced care planning discuss, discussions. Some individuals may already have living wills drafted. And we talk about that. Is that something where, you know, 10 years ago you may have had uh, this living will drafted and now you either changed your mind or, yeah, where is that living will? I, I right. want to talk more about this. Um, and then ha healthcare um, power of attorneys, you want to designate that individual, whoever it is that you trust, uh, to speak on behalf of you. So it's that kind of, that, that kind of a discussion where goals of care naturally uh, a transition into that discussion of advanced care planning. Mm -hmm. Certainly there are individuals where they may not have a di diagnosis of a chronic illness and they just go straight to the advanced care planning because we don't need a goals of care discussion per se, um, but they just want to do the advanced care planning for the future, 10, 20 years from now, they are pretty adamant of what they want and what right. they don't want in, when it comes to procedures, medicine, aggressive measures and things like this. And then palliative care utilizes a, a third big aspect of what we do is symptom management. Now, some individuals, we walk in and it's all about the goals of care discussion. Mm -hmm. And we probably don't even get to the advanced care planning just yet. Um, sometimes it's all three where we have to manage symptoms along with doing a goals of care discussion and along with doing an advanced care planning discussion. And then there are individuals where you know, we don't want to do the, the goals of care discussion. I'm just not ready. It just, it just scares me. It scares me to talk about stuff like that right now. Right. Um, or the advanced care planning part. But can you, can you please help me? My, I'm having a lot of pain. This, this is the, the, the pain is affecting my quality of life. I just want to be able to walk in the mall. I, I want to be able to play with my grandkids. Um, I, I want to be less short of breath when I'm walking from point A to point B. And I've had these kinds of, those are goals also. There are certain goals that also are also discussed when talking about symptom management. So palliative care as a specialty, palliative care medicine, encompasses these three big aspects that we, 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 um, uh, we, we address these three things and they tend to be time intensive. They are in-depth discussions. I also talk about if it's certain symptoms, like if we have to use certain opioids, like right. morphine or Dilaudid or uh, you know, other medications, even for shortness of breath. Um, it's, it's good to have a conversation about not just how this can help you, but how it can also, in terms of hurting you, these risks that are involved when utilizing certain medications. Um, so that's typically a, a palliative care consult can run anywhere from as short as 30 minutes because the person probably, or the family member would probably know very quickly, here's what I want, or here's what he or she would have wanted, uh, and here's what they don't want, or here's what I don't want. And then it's kind of quick in terms of that, but then we right. focus more on the symptom a aspect. But either way, it's those three, we address those three big aspects in palliative care medicine, and it's basically to alleviate suffering. It's a way to um, improve quality of life while a person is going through what they're going through with a diagnosis. So um, how is it different from hospice uh, care? Hospice care is more about end of life. It's more about when physicians pretty much agree that the, the prognosis of life is six months or less. If the prognosis of life is six months or less, you should really start thinking about talking about hospice services and where was that setting going to be uh, if hospice is going to be given. Right. Um, so if your prognosis of life is less than six months, um, if you're willing and if family who's 
who, if you are not the mouthpiece, if you're, if you're the patient, you're not unable to speak for yourself, you can't talk, and someone's talking on behalf of you, and they tell us as, as physicians, you know, mom would have never wanted to be on machines. Uh, this is a time when, you know, we need to stop with all the procedures and, and needle pokes and just stop all that and keep them comfortable. Um, you know, if there's that type of mindset and readiness, when can we all really be ready? But, right. but when we're faced with something like that, certain individuals know. And, and that's when they tell us, please stop those things. And so there's, there's that aspect. And then you, you basically, it's a paperwork of which you need to sign on. Now, in order to have a palliative care consultant come and see you, you don't have to sign anything. It's much like how a cardiologist comes to see you or a pulmonologist comes to see you. Um, palliative care consultants can come see you at the same way. So there's no signature or paperwork or anything to sign on to receive those types of services. But for hospice care, there is. Um, we also talked prior to our, us being here about right. settings. And so settings for, for hospice and for palliative care could be at any setting where um, they can come to your home and offer you services at your own home. Um, they can come to uh, skilled nursing facilities or uh, subacute rehab facilities, inpatient rehab facilities. Um, and the most commonly used is in-house or in-hospital in for palliative care services. Um, for hospice, it, it depends. Now, for hospice services, if a person is actively dying, it's, it, the terminology is called actively dying, if that is happening within hours to maybe, maybe days, um, it's probably better to stay in the hospital if you are in the hospital before that transition occurs. So you, you stay in the hospital for inpatient hospice services. Uh, sometimes you're in the hospital and you're what we call stable, meaning that you, you are still going to still going to be alive so that you can make the transition from point A to point B, meaning hospital to home, mm -hmm. uh, where the hospice services would then come to your home. And, and offer uh, hospice services and comfort care, total comfort care in the home setting. Um, and again, with that prognosis of less than six, six months of life. Um, and it, it also can occur in facilities, in skilled nursing facilities, like say nursing homes is another term for that. Uh, the issue now when it comes to certain hospice services is that if you don't have the coverage, the health insurance coverage, this may become an out-of-pocket expense. And that's where it becomes uh, tough for individuals who don't have the financial resources right. to, because they may want hospice services at a skilled nursing facility but just can't afford the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, prices sure. of staying at a skilled nursing facility. And so, um, so, so you have to work with a social worker in terms of how, to, how, how do we manage that and how do we get there. Um, but having a social worker in place uh, can help you with navigating how do you get from that transition to, to that end of life. But again, palliative care services is, it's not hospice services, they are separate entities. And yet, just as life transitions from, from birth to death, um, we have these, and, and, and I, I, if I had a graph in front of me, it would be kind of like riding this up and down wave. For sure. Where if I take an example of, say, congestive heart failure, right. we would want to be in a stable chronic condition where we don't have the shortness of breath, we're able to walk in a mall, we're able to talk without feeling short of breath. But then you can get an acute exacerbation of the chronic, and then you kind of, you know, you dip down and you need the hospital and then they get you better and then you kind of come back up again. And so you kind of ride this, this wave over time. And the hope, of course, is that you get the least amount of acute exacerbations with that and live the longest amount of life possible with quality of life. Hmm. Now, that heart failure is going to turn to severe one day. And again, we are hoping that it's somewhere 10, maybe 20 years down the road. For some individuals, it's less. And we have to talk about where that person is if they're, if they're struggling through life and can't enjoy life like they once were. Um, 
in palliative care, we try to address the emotions that are coming along with that change in life. So as the chronic gets more severe in time with any diagnosis, right. there's depression, there's anxiety, there's these emotions that flood you, your, your support system changes, uh, they too can feel the strain and stress, and there is also caregiver burnout now being talked about more. Um, so in palliative care, so, so just kind of wrapping and kind of summarizing that all up, uh, um, it's utilizing those three, those three aspects, the goals of care discussion about where your body is, what's the diagnosis, um, how it's impacting your life, and again, the advanced care planning, uh, that natural lead-in from the goals of care discussion to an advanced care planning discussion, and then symptom, symptom management, if there are symptoms that are there. And if they are, we address them and we talk about the risks and the benefits to certain, certain, uh, to certain medications or procedures. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those important distinctions and clarifications. Mm. Uh, can you briefly tell us about the origins of palliative care and kind of your, what led you into this subspecialty? Yeah. So, um, so palliative care uh, as a specialty actually stemmed out of hospice. And hospice started somewhere around the 1940s by Dame Cicely, uh, Cicely Saunders. She was a British uh, physician. And she started recognizing how individuals were suffering through, through their end of life mm -hmm. and focused on wishes and goals for those individuals. And what she did was, was a beautiful thing for those individuals who were suffering because then you managed those symptoms so that people would still go through whatever nature, however nature takes its course towards the end, you, you try to soften and alleviate those symptoms. So people sometimes went through real profound shortness of breath or pain. Um, and through that suffering, she, she focused on managing and alleviating those symptoms. And so over time, that, those, that type of palliation, because again, palliate means to alleviate suffering, palliative care as a specialty started branching out from hospice uh, as a specialty, as we started recognizing that um, physicians would then do what we call do everything. So, so even the chest compressions and mm -hmm. mechanical ventilation, oxygen, or, or various types of pr uh, oxygen pr using pressure. Um, for individuals where, um, you know, they, they were in the severe bracket, and it could be that they didn't want those things, and yet we kept focusing on trying to keep the pulse and the heartbeat and, and them breathing when they were clearly suffering and it wasn't going to change for, for the better, okay? There wasn't going to be a positive outcome here. So um, then, and then all of a sudden there's this break where it's like, okay, yeah, let's use hospice. And then things just kind of stopped. And then there's this ability to utilize hospice services. and. Unfortunately, nowadays, even though the prognosis might be less than six months, we tend to use hospice services more like in hours to days. Mm -hmm. So the person is not really gaining the benefit of the alleviation of suffering through those last six months of life. So there's this, there's this aggressive nature, and then all of a sudden there's this cutoff. And so in palliative care, what we've recognized as, as time continued was that it started to separate a bit from hospice care because then you can you can institute these discussions and say, okay, we're kind of in the moderate phase right now. We're not so severe, we're more in the moderate. Um, how are you doing? And some right. people might say, you know, mom suffered on a machine right. for, for months on end and I don't want that to happen to me. Um, you know, we get stories and people share their stories and they realize in this particular phase that they probably would not want certain aggressive things done. So in palliative care medicine, what we're able to do is um, gradually talk about these things, gradually start realizing, stop the procedures, stop the surgeries, or I don't want to come to the hospital anymore. Well, what are the consequences of that if we stop certain things? Um, so that's part of the goals of care discussion. So there's this more gradual um, uh, uh, introduction of discussion, mm -hmm. of planning, 
and just discussing symptoms and risks and benefits so that it's not so you're not so blindsided right when when the end really does come you know very good um, points i yeah. see we have a caller also uh caller you can go ahead and put you through through your question my hello yes you're on air yeah okay my question is how accessible is palica care I think I heard how accessible is palliative care. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So accessible accessibility um, for individuals who are covered with um, health care insurance, uh, palliative care consultations uh, are just like any other consultation, just like with cardiology consultations, pulmonolo pulmonology pulmonology uh, consultations, endocrinology. So. It should be accessible just the same way, uh, through payment rather, um, mm -hmm. as it is through those other consultants. Um, so, so if you have a copay, it's just the same for when consultants or other consultants are coming to see you. Um, um, for individuals who don't have the means, they don't have the financial resources, my strong recommendation is to still uh, reach out to, st to the organizations and see if they have the ability to still grant those services, either through a sliding scale or through the ability to say, yes, we're going to be able to do this for, and this is how we're going to help. Um, so I would still pursue, but for the individuals who are covered by health care insurance, it is that the coverage is just the same as it would be for other consultation services. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. Uh, before we end, our, I would like to touch upon, uh, as a palliative care physician, what are the common um, forms of treatment that you employ? Okay, yeah, good question. So um, uh, the, the most common that we see are our pain and shortness of breath. Uh, and that can be through either cancer-related diagnosis, it could be through congestive heart failure or heart disease, it could be through emphysema um, or, or pulmonary fibrosis. So any one of the, the diseases where it's heart disease, not just heart disease, not just coronary arterial disease, not just heart failure, valvular disease, or mm -hmm. anything that where it puts you in a phase where you're, you now are diagnosed with a chronic disease and you're going to live with that and there is no cure to it. So if there's no cure to that particular chronic disease, typically individuals will go through this acute on chronic problem. And so the acute on chronic issues that we tend to see, the more common ones are the ones where there's pain, um, there's um, shortness of breath, and then the ones that can also come about, and, and, it, could, and it doesn't happen that often, and it may be because um, individuals have a tough time understanding when they're going through it, is that there's depression, uh, there's anxiety. Uh, so some individuals even, their gut slows down. So mm -hmm. they may experience things like nausea because their gut is just not digesting the way it used to, or constipation. Um, there is agitation, there is confusion, especially in the later stages for certain diagnoses. So we address those types of symptoms. And again, for the pain and for the shortness of breath, sometimes we need uh, opioids to turn to opioids. And I know that we're in a particular time right now where we talk about the opioid crisis, but for these individuals, this doesn't apply to them because they're diagnosed with a, a very serious illness, a chronic illness that can land them in the hospital from time to time, right. as opposed to individuals where there is none of these diagnoses and yet they're still uh, struggling with, with addiction or, or problems in terms of taking opioids. So for our patients, um, this is more about their, uh, their walk through the, these chronic diseases. So again, so shortness of breath, pain, we tend to utilize opioids. And we had a discussion last time about, um, right. about uh, the traditional Chinese medicine and utilizing aspects and other modalities to try to help with symptoms. And I am, as, as a Chinese doc, I, I'm all for that. Right. Uh, so sometimes we try to use other modalities to address shortness of breath and pain. Um, massage, acupuncture, and, and things like this. So um, hopefully more of this type of dialogue to come uh, in the future. 
hopefully as well. Uh, thank you for tuning in today to um, our session on palliative care. Uh, hope you had some or learned some valuable information. And thank you for sharing your valuable information with us, Dr. Salvador. Thank you. Remember to tune in next week on an episode on back to school physicals. And thank you for tuning in.